Hi everyone. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um. Anyone else who can hear me? Yeah. Hi, Ajay Nishan. This side. Hey. Hi. Great. Cool. So it's just seven. Let me check if uh, everybody else is on. And uh, who else is on? Basically, some people said they have uh, other stuff to do, so they may not join. But uh, yeah, that should be fine, I guess. They can always view this online. Hi, who's there? Yes, yes. Hello. Hello. Okay. Okay. So I was actually <laughs> running another video on the side and uh, that was echoing. So I stopped that now. I'm trying to see where the settings are for this. How can I put everyone on mute? So what I'm doing is uh, putting everyone on mute and uh, video on off initially so that uh, we don't, I mean, so Google actually just uh, switches between people as soon as it detects somebody talking. So we won't, we don't want that to be interrupting the whole session. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to switch all audio off for everyone. And later, I'll also go on mute once we finish with the introduction. And then uh, as soon as Madhu starts, we'll um, I'll, be, I'll also be on mute, but I'll be around. Um, people, you can also join the chat. There is a chat on the left side. So you can uh, ask your questions here. Or you can also go ahead and uh, you can also go ahead and uh, put your messages up on the Facebook page. We will, I will be tracking that. So you could do that as well. Cool. So. Um, to introduce Madhu, so this is again hello and welcome to the second online workshop for the GoUNESCO Campus Ambassadors. Um, we are trying to give you uh, some kind of benefit for helping us out at GoUNESCO. Uh, you might have heard uh, we just finished our finale last Saturday. Uh, it was uh, it was pretty awesome. We had uh, quite a few people turn up and. Uh, one of the guests was from UNESCO New Delhi. The other guest was from Intact Hyderabad, Indian National Trust for Arts, Culture, and Heritage. Um, there were two other guests also. One was the director of Salah Jung Museum in Hyderabad. And uh, the other final guest was from the Andhra Pradesh State um, Department for Museums and Archaeology. Uh, so they were there. The winners uh, took away some really cool prizes. And uh, Nishant is actually one of the winners uh, last year. So he's also on the uh, workshop right now. He's also on the session. Um, but basically, we are trying to, like I mentioned on the Facebook group also, we are trying to make this big this year, the Campus Ambassador Program. I am looking for a lot more uh, um, spread in terms of the number of universities. And I'm also looking at the number of activities being uh, much more than what we have done previously. But it's great that we have got to here. Uh, you people have actually helped me get that confidence. And uh, for that, I thank you. Um, I'm looking forward to your help in the future also. Uh, we will be, uh, I will be updating you on all the other plans which as and when we uh, get there. 
Uh, but um, for now, let's begin with this workshop today. To introduce you to Madhu, she is a photographer. She has uh, been photographing. I mean, you can also check her work online. She has a passion for old city in Hyderabad. She keeps photographing whenever possible. She has done a lot of. She has put up a lot of beautiful pictures on her uh, blog called. Uh, uh, okay, which one is that, Madhu? Is that Adab? Adab. Adab. Yeah. Yeah, so that's adabheatherward.blogspot.com, and uh, she does a lot of travel photography as well. And uh, so that's a brief introduction. She's also on the Goinesco Challenge, by the way. So uh, second person to give the work, I mean, take a workshop, conduct a workshop rather, and uh, second person also on Goinesco Challenge. Hopefully, we'll have a lot more uh, different uh, 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 people on these sessions in the future. Maybe some people from abroad also. I don't know if Ashanti has joined today. Ashanti, Stephanie, uh, but uh, they they did RSVP. Yes. If they are not able to join the live chat, they can always uh, view this online. Um, so there's some good stuff happening in these sessions, and I like that uh, we are seeing some part participation. This time more people have joined on the Hangouts, which is uh, encouraging. Last time I believe everybody was on the YouTube video directly. Uh, so you can ask questions on the group chat window on the right corner of your Hangout window. Uh, so I'll turn over now to Madhu. Madhu, you can take it over. So basically, I'll just uh, prepare you for what is happening. So you can uh, see a link to a presentation. It's a slide share presentation. I have uploaded it on the event workshop. Uh, OK, I haven't done that yet, but I'll do that now. Uh, basically, you can view that presentation, and uh, um, Madhu will be going over that presentation um, as we begin. Uh, you can also see the presentation online right here. I've just shared it on the event page on Facebook. If you want, you can open that for reference as well. Uh, we'll be going over principles of taking pictures, better pictures at monuments. This is not going into a lot of detail. This will be a little high level, but it will help you in designing or rather thinking about the basic concepts which should, you should keep in mind when you're taking photographs of monuments especially. This is not portrait photography. This is not interior photography. This is photography of monuments, which is very relevant to what we do at GoInesco. There's plenty of people taking pictures of World Heritage Sites and uh, monuments also. So now I'll turn it over to Madhu now, and uh, she will take it on from here. Yes, Madhu, you can begin. I will go on mute. Uh, if I'm required, just let me know. OK. And, Do you uh, hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay. Yeah. Too loud? No, no, this is pretty okay. good. Yeah. Uh, so hi, hi everyone. Uh, one thing all of us here have in common is obviously our love for travel. That's why we're all on Go UNESCO. Now, it's true that a lot of us travel just for the experience, but we do put in a lot of time, effort, and enthusiasm into all of this. So it's always great to come back with a nice set of photos and relive the experience every time we go through them. So like Ajay said, today I'm going to share some tips with you that will hopefully, ha hopefully help you come back with a better set of pictures the next time you go to a World Heritage Site or any other monument for that matter. I'll try and keep things as general as possible so that it doesn't matter what kind of camera you're using. This will pretty much apply to everyone. Uh, so I'll now share my screen with you and uh, show you some of the slides that I made. What you have uh, shared on the Facebook page has just the uh, slides with the text. I'll be sharing quite a bit of photos here to illustrate the points I'm making there. So uh, I'm sharing my screen now. Uh, does everyone see this? OK, cool. So uh, I thought I'll just begin with how a photo is formed in your camera. Now, it doesn't matter what camera it is again. Uh, you, all you have is your subject, and you have your camera. Look at the image on the top left, that little uh, diagram there. So uh, the boy standing there is your subject. So light reflected off your subject enters the camera through your lens. It passes through an opening behind it called the aperture. Behind the aperture, you have the shutter. The shutter remains closed by default. Only when you press the shutter release button, which is that main button you press to click a photo, 
that's the only time it opens. It stays open for the duration of the photo and then it closes again. So it opens, allows light inside, and then your camera forms an image of uh, your subject on the film. Or since we are talking about digital cameras, it forms an image on the sensor, which then records it. Now, uh, there are two things that we need to control. The main components you see are the aperture and shutter that contribute uh, to the image formation. The first thing is you need to decide the length of time for which the shutter remains open. This you can control by changing the shutter speed. The second factor is the amount of light coming in while the shutter is open. This you can vary by changing the size of the aperture. If too much light comes in, your photo will appear white and washed out. If too little comes in, it will be all dark. So basically your camera needs to measure the brightness of different parts of the image and then use some algorithms to calculate what the overall exposure must be because uh, your image will have some bright regions, some dark regions, so it needs to take all these things into account and decide how much to expose. These are this, this process is called metering, the process of calculating how much light to allow inside. In loose terms, that's what it is. You decide how much light to allow inside. Now, one common example that people use while explaining the concept of shutter speed and aperture is a tap water example. Basically, you have a tap and you have a bucket which you need to fill with water. If you open your tap really thin, it will take a long time to fill the bucket, obviously. And then if you open it really thick, the bucket will, will fill up very fast. Exposures like that. If the aperture is narrow, you need to keep the shutter open for a long time to expose the image properly. If the aperture is wide, you only need to open the shutter for a short while. One last important variable that I want to mention is the focal length. Technically, it is the distance between the lens and the sensor when the subject is in focus. You can see this in the diagram. Uh, it's normally measured in millimeters. Uh, essentially, it tells you how close you are to the image. Uh, we talk about zoom lenses, right? You zoom in and out. That's how you get closer to the image or farther away. Now, um, there are different kinds of cameras you could be using. Basically, for every shot, you need to decide the shutter speed, aperture, exposure, and all of that. Uh, if you're using your camera in an automatic mode, which is the way it is in most compact point-and-shoot cameras, your mobile phone cameras, you really don't need to decide all these things. The camera decides for you. Whereas on SLR cameras, you have complete control over all these things. You can operate it in a manual mode, and you can personally decide what what the shutter speed must be, what the aperture size must be, and all of that. Now, you can take compelling photos, whether you're using a traditional tiny point-and-shoot or an SLR or your uh, phone's camera. So it really doesn't matter, and I'm going to keep this generic. So uh, you look at the list on the right side. That's basically the steps that go into forming a photo. The first thing you do is you go to the place. Uh, whatever monument you're visiting, look around, decide what story you want to tell through your photos. You look through the viewfinder or your LCD and you compose the image. And then you have to control the light. Uh, we're going to assume that you're using everything in an automatic mode, so I'm not really going to talk about light. So the composition is ready, the light is done, now you just shoot. Now it's digital, so you have all the freedom in the world to review, reshoot, review, reshoot till you're happy with the pictures. And then you go home, transfer your photos to your computer. If you like, you can process them to enhance some stuff. But that's about it. That's what goes into the making of a photo. Uh, so with these basics out of the way, we'll now go straight to monument photography. All right. The first requirement for a good photo is good light, obviously. So uh, let's now talk about when we have the best light to take pictures of a monument. The thumb rule is this, when light falls on the monument at an angle, that's the best time. So this happens in early mornings, mid morning, late afternoon, around sunset. The extra advantage you have with early mornings is that there's no crowd, so you don't have people messing up your photo, and you have soft light, the sun is still not harsh, and then you can also finish up quickly before it gets too hot. The bright colors in the sky around sunset are also pretty awesome. You have these, uh, it's like the typical Instagram kind of sky with multiple hues in the sky. Those work great if you're attempting silhouettes. 
I'll talk about that a little later. Sunny days with deep blue skies and fluffy white clouds are my favorite kind of day. Those make the most colorful backdrops. You have direct sunlight, so you get strong contrasts, you get crisp shadows. But the downside of having strong contrast is that you lose a little bit of the details. What I mean by that is some of the details disappear into the shadows. This kind of light is usually called hard light. Now what happens when you have a cloud cover? Some days are not blue, you just have this uh, dull white cloud cover. That's not always a bad thing because clouds act as diffusers. You have water droplets in the clouds. They kind of scatter the light in all directions. So it's not like a harsh direct light. You get a soft light, your monument, whatever you're photographing is illuminated evenly all over. You don't have harsh shadows. Even in the shadow regions, you have a reasonable amount of details. So obviously contrast is low. As a result, if you have too much of a cloud cover, that is if the clouds are too thick, you'll have a very flat and dull photo. So you, you basically need a little bit of shadows to give your image depth. So you need to strike that balance between contrast and shadows. One thing to avoid, um, OK, yeah, rainy days. Rainy days can be quite dramatic, but keeping your gear safe is a challenge. You do get protective cases and stuff you can get for your camera. That's the kind of um, equipment people use for uh, you know, tip, uh, rain photos or really close to waterfalls or even underwater photography. But that's, for, that's only if you're really serious about investing in that sort of equipment. The best option, if you want, is to shoot right after it rains. When, when it rains, all the particles in the air are kind of washed down. Everything is clean. So colors in your uh, monument really pop. And also your equipment stays safe. This is ideal. The main thing you need to avoid is shooting when the front of the monument is in a shadow region. So uh, what happens is, before going to the place, if you can find out in which direction the monument faces, then you can really time your visit so that it's not in a shadow. Uh, for, an, for, uh, for an example, uh, in the old city of Hyderabad, I keep going to photograph mosques. We know that all mosques face Mecca. So in India, uh, they are illuminated by the sun in the early morning. So as a thumb rule, I only go in the mornings if I want to shoot mosques. So it really helps to find out beforehand the orientation of the building. Now sometimes uh, you, you're really there just for one day. Time is difficult to make for travel. You have one day off, you take a day off from work and you go. So you really don't have the flexibility to pick and choose the time. So uh, a few slides down the line, I'll show you how you can make the best of um, a time like that when you know the uh, sun is behind the monument. So uh, I, I'll now show you some examples. This is a typical day with a white cloud cover. Now you can see that the illumination is pretty even throughout. You can see a good amount of details, but it's not so contrasty, and you can see that it lacks some kind of punch, right? So uh, look at the same place on a day when there was a blue sky and there were white fluffy clouds. See the difference it makes to the colors. Now it's not the exact same photo, but it's the same place. You can see that shadows are deeper. You do lose some details in the shadows, but overall it's much more vibrant. So this is what you get when you go on a sunny day with a blue sky and a little bit of cloud here and there. A plain blue sky can also get boring. And now this is what happens on a rainy day. Now this was on a really rainy day. It rained almost all day. And I shot this picture when the rain stopped briefly in between. So you can see that colors are bright. And also you have dark clouds above because there was more rain to come. Those actually make the picture more dramatic. If it's just white clouds, all it does is make the whole thing dull. But dark rain clouds add drama, which is always welcome. And now this is the disaster that happens when the front of your building is in shadow. There's nothing you can salvage out of this. So now we move on from light to composition. Is there anything you want to ask? Do you want to ask now or later, Ajay? Uh, people, you can ask anytime you want. You can uh, start uh, questions on the group chat. Or you could also put it up on the uh, Facebook group page. I'll be monitoring that. 
So you could do it either way. I mean, uh, if you have questions which really require you to ask the question right away, uh, please go ahead and ask on the chat window. I'm uh, putting everybody on mute so that at least uh, Madhu doesn't get disrupted or interrupted. But you can always ask using the chat. All right. Okay. Yeah, so Madhu, yeah, go on. Okay, so I'm now moving on to composition from light. The deal is that you can pick the kind of day you want to shoot on, but I'm not going into manual control of your shutter and aperture settings. So um, if you're using your camera on automatic mode, all you can do is pick the right time to shoot and move on. So now uh, you will see my, um, do I have to share my screen again or do you see it? Yeah, all right. So uh, we now uh, begin with composition. Wide shots which show the whole monument are pretty common. That's the kind of thing most people tend to take. But don't dismiss it just because it's common. With the right light and symmetry, you can make them look great. But don't stop with just that. You can do a lot more to get a nice set of compelling photos. So zoom in, capture carvings, sculptures, and all the little details that you can notice. Get low. Try low angles. You can you'll see that a statue, if you if you if you take a picture of a statue standing right in front of it, and then try another picture of the st same statue from a lower angle, you'll see that some features are exaggerated. So you get really quirky, interesting pictures. And also walk all around the monument. You never know what you're going to find at the back or on the sides. You might find something really interesting. Look for repeating patterns. Uh, a frame with a single repeating pattern is an awesome image. Repetitions are always awesome. And then look for images, look for views of the monuments from other places. Walk around the neighborhood, go to other nearby buildings, see if you get a nice view from there. Generally walk around and see if you spot something interesting. But this will work only if the monument is reasonably big because unless it's really tall, you won't see it from uh, other places. The Taj Mahal, for example, is visible from a lot of places. Uh, I spotted it driving around in Agra and then again when you go to the Red Fort you again have a view of it. So don't limit a monument just to that monument. There may be other places which give you interesting views of it. So let's look at some examples now. This is the traditional wide shot. This is cliched but you can make it attractive and if you come back and show it to somebody who hasn't been there they know exactly what it looks like. Or you can zoom in and capture the little details. The thing about this image is that this carving is just about a foot tall. but it, And you can actually miss it when you're walking around. But if you fill up your frame with it, it looks totally different. And then I'm going to the next example. Walk around. You'll, you'll, you'll definitely find interesting stuff to shoot if you walk around. This shows a little bit of local culture. And if you come back and show the picture to someone, they'll probably wonder what the significance of the lemons and the rituals is. It's definitely a conversation um, theme. This picture, this is an Eidga. It's uh, seen from the lane behind it. You can see only a part of it, just a couple of the minarets. So that adds a little bit of the mystery. And you wonder who lives on this street, who lives in these houses. And you just get a sneak peek of the monument. It's a very interesting perspective. Another cool thing you can do is look for interesting ways to frame the monument. Most of these places have arches or gateways and stuff. Try and frame the main building through those. Or maybe you're driving by, frame it through the window of your car, through the leaves of a tree. Or like I was saying, from another monument. And one great thing to look for is reflections. It could be in ponds or if it has rain, you can look for puddles. You can like look at rear view mirrors of parked cars or windshields pretty much anywhere. It could be reflections, it could be shadows. Just try and think out of the box. Uh, and I'll show you some examples of framing. So um, this is that, uh, it's like a scalloped kind of arch and you look at one part, it doesn't have to be the whole monument you're framing. It could be one interesting portion or one bunch of carvings you're trying to show off. Look for interesting ways to frame them. This is the Taj Mahal through the gateway. Um, now these people standing here, you notice that the uh, portion behind them is bright, whereas the foreground is dark and the people, you can only see the outline of the people. This is called a silhouette. 
and I'll be talking more about this in a bit. Somebody pinged? Yes, Madhu. Um, yeah. Tejinder had a question. Okay. Um, he asks, when we are traveling, we generally don't know what kind of weather we will encounter. Right. Since most of the times it's sunny, mm -hmm. do we have some standard EXIF details we can use or uh, okay. you can work around with? Uh, the day with EXIF details is you have that kind of control of um, you know aperture and shutter only when you're using an SLR or high-end point and shoot. Uh, what I'm going to uh, talk about in a while is, uh, see I just told you the ideal kind of conditions where you can take pictures. But obviously we don't know what kind of weather we're going to encounter. So what we can do is find workarounds. For example, if you're stuck with the monument lit up from behind and the front is entirely in shadow, you won't get the best pictures, but there are things you can do to come back with decent pictures. I'll be talking about lens flares and silhouettes a little while later. Uh, those are workarounds for backlit monuments. Or when you have a, a rainy day, you, you are going to get good pictures. It's not the ideal kind of uh, setting, like, you know, uh, there's nothing as good as angular illumination of a building, but even overhead shadows work, a rainy day works. You can pretty much make anything work for you. All you have to do is find workarounds and look at you know, creative ways of, um, you may not get the traditional wide shot, but there are other things you can do. Does that answer that? Uh, cool. I'll watch out for what Tejinder says. Okay. Uh, you can carry on till then. Okay. Yeah. Now this is a bottom up kind of uh, framing. It, you can see it's framed by an arch. This is Humayun's tomb. And uh, there's a, another concept in this photo that I'll be talking about a little later. You can see that the staircase and the railings on both sides kind of lead your eyes to the two women and then to the monument. These are called leading lines and you can really use them to your advantage while composing photos. We'll talk about leading lines in a bit. And then you can look for reflections. This is a regular pond, but reflections can happen even in muddy puddles after a rain. Uh, the thing to remember here is it was a blue sky kind of day, so the water's blue. If it had been a white uh, sky day, you wouldn't have had so many colors in the frame, but it would still be interesting. So now, um, in some temples, they don't let you take pictures inside. Uh, but if they allow you to take pictures inside the monument, don't forget to do that. Photos of the interiors add so much to your uh, story. Try and take photos of the outside from the inside. And churches and places like that have beautiful stained glass. Um, many places, Mughal monuments have perforated screens. So these cast beautiful patterns of light and shadow. Keep your eyes open for those. And uh, you get dramatic shafts of light as well, especially in churches. Look out for those. Look up and see if the ceiling is, uh, if the ceiling deserves a shot, or if you're going to climb up staircases and balconies. Remember to look down. Let's look at some examples. This is an example of taking a photo of the outside when you are inside. So you get a little bit of the monument, and you also get the view that is outside, framed by the monument itself. And this is, these are how you uh, photograph shafts of light. This is a church. This is the Afghan church in Bombay. If you're using an SLR, you need to underexpose a little bit so that you get really sharp shafts of light. You, uh, you can even do this with your mobile phone camera. Uh, we've done it. I wish I'd uh, shared the photo, but it's actually possible even in your mobile phone. Uh, this is how you can look out for perforated screens and the little dots of light they throw on the floor. Again, you might have to underexpose a little bit, otherwise your camera will expose for the bright regions and everything will become too white. Look up, you might find a really interesting ceiling, or look down. Sometimes you can climb up to the first level or second level of the monument. Make sure you look down and see if there's any, anything interesting there. Now, distractions aren't really distractions if you can use them to your advantage. Uh, monuments especially, if you haven't been to them, you've only seen pictures, you don't know how big they are, right? So use people, vehicles, and familiar objects to convey the size of the monument. Now I don't know how big, a ta how big the Taj Mahal is if I haven't been there, 
but I know how tall the average person is. So put a person next to the Taj Mahal and you can establish scale that way. People also add color and movement to the photo. A running child or a, uh, you know, a guy on a bicycle. These are things that the building is stationary at the back, whereas this person or this cycle has a slight blur to it. So you can show movement in the photo. Or you can just make the monument the uh, secondary thing. Put something else in front, some other subject like Chilean or hawkers or whatever, and make the monument the backdrop. Who says the monument always has to be the main story? It doesn't have to be. Or if you have local people in the frame, it adds character or you know you could call it the exotic value if you have locals in the frame. Pigeons or any other bird, awesome. They add a lot of atmosphere. Try and avoid distractions like wire and garbage. Those are distractions that are really distractions. So uh, some examples. Now this is Mahabalipuram and this uh, woman in the blue sari was sweeping the floor over there. So you can see that she adds a nice pop of blue to what is otherwise just a uh, brown frame overall. And you also see how big that wall is because you know how tall she must be. And you can also, uh, the thing to remember in this is um, the closer the uh, person is to you, the smaller the monument is going to look. So by moving the, uh, you know, the, the person or the vehicle, whatever you're using, back and forth, you can actually even exaggerate or uh, underplay the size of the monument. Uh, you must have seen pictures in which, you know, people are holding the top of the Taj Mahal or holding the sun in their hand. That's how it works. You move the person back and forth and you actually play with the size of the main subject. In this, in this picture, the monument is secondary. Uh, the, the photo is about a group of school children who belong to that village and the monument forms a nice background. And here, pigeons pretty much make the story. Otherwise, it's just a pretty bland image. It's, there's nothing to it if the pigeons weren't there. And then, like I said, local people really add character to the photo. This is a temple in Kanchipuram, and the priest of that temple kind of walked by, and I was lucky to get a picture of that. And um, it really, otherwise it would have just been a bland image of three pillars and pretty much nothing else. Now, some more general composition tips. Make sure your horizon and lines are straight. Horizon is that, you know, the uh, strip right at the back of your image where the sky meets your uh, ground. Make sure it is straight. The horizontal and vertical lines. Make sure they are make sure they are actually horizontal and vertical. Otherwise, your photo is going to look crooked. You can rotate the image and correct it while you post process. But one thing that's really hard to correct is your planes. If your planes are not leveled, then it's going to be very hard to correct. Also, you can use something called the rule of thirds. The normal um, tendency is to put the subject right at the middle of the image. More interesting than that is uh, if you place it on one of the spots that the rule of thirds tell you, tells you. Now this is a this is an image. You have three women in the in front, and you have a fourth gate at the back. Now if you draw two vertical lines and two horizontal lines, you actually divide the image into nine zones. And look at the four points in the middle. You can place your subject at one of those four points for maximum impact. So the Women in this frame are in the bottom right uh, intersecting point. You can also place something else of interest on the opposite corner to kind of uh, balance it out also. Minimalism is another technique you can use. Like have the uh, subject occupy a very small part of the image. I'll show you examples for all of these. And then I told you about leading lines, right? You can have lines of roads, pathways, driveways, staircases that visually pull your focus to the subject. And you can use these same leading lines to convey depth as well. And you can line up the elements of your photograph along the diagonal, which also creates a very interesting composition. I'll now show you examples of these. I showed you the rule of thirds. Now this is a photo which is diagonally composed. So I draw this line across and you can see that the elements are kind of along the diagonal. The upper half pretty much has only sky. This is minimalism. The uh, subject of my photo occupies a very small portion. This is about just 20% of the frame. 80% is left empty. 
and look at what happens when you don't line up your lines and planes. To make it worse, this is a pretty big building, so there is some distortion as well, which uh, could be corrected by stepping back, but the lines and planes, once you mess them up, it's really hard to straighten them. So before you press your shutter release, always make sure your lines and planes are in place. This is a use of leading lines to um, attract attention to the subject. You have the, uh, on both sides, you have a line of trees that pulls your eye to the Taj Mahal. And in front, you have a line of flowers, again, leading you to the subject. If you're using an SLR, you will see that it is really not necessary to have your subject in focus. Some buildings are so iconic, even if you blur them, they are very easily recognizable. This is another use of leading lines to show depth. You can see how these four uh, diagonal lines pull your eye to the center of the image. So this is how you can show depth. This is what I was talking about. This is what you can do when you find yourself at the monument at an odd time and the sun is behind it. You can use something called lens flares. Now lens flare happens when you point your camera in the direction of the sun. What happens is light goes through uh, internal reflection and scattering within the material of the lens. So you get strange artifacts like a haze or starburst, rings or circles. Usually it's considered an unwanted effect and you can minimize it by using a hood, but I think it really adds a dreamy quality to any picture. Uh, the uh, things to keep in mind are you need to shoot into the sun at an angle. Don't include the whole sun. Let the building cut out majority of it. And also don't point directly at the sun because you'll end up messing with your eyes as well as your camera sensor. So don't do that. I'll show you examples of this shortly. Uh, silhouettes are one more thing you can do. When your subject is lit from behind, you'll only see the uh, outline of the monument. So if you underexpose a bit, you can make the um, you know, subject really solid. And the background, uh, the sky is always illuminated at such a time. But uh, rather than a plain white sky or a blue sky, look, target the time of sunset. That's when you have the maximum number of hues in the sky. So the uh, monument is like black and you have a multicolored sky. That's the best effect you can get. Now if you have, if you go to your office building and take a picture, what you're going to see in a silhouette is a two-dimensional outline. So you have to make sure the building has a distinct identifiable outline. If you just take a picture of your office building like this, all you'll see is a black rectangle. Whereas if, it's, if it has a distinct outline, you can recognize the building just from the silhouette. The sun need not be right behind the building. It just has to be in front of you. It can be to the side as well. If you're using a DSLR, you can underexpose a bit. And don't use auto white balance. You might lose colors. I think this applies only to high-end uh, point and shoots and DSLRs. Um, somebody pinged. Yeah, oh, I'll yes, just Madhu, yeah. Are you showing examples right now or uh, just the presentation? Uh, I, I, just, I just showed an example for level planes. I'll just go back there and show you, okay? Okay, okay. All right. So you should be seeing a brown um, monument with a lot of patterns on it, correct? Do you see the slide? Uh, the, the heading is lines and planes, not straight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, basically what I mean when I say planes are not straight is, uh, this one showed up actually. I do remember this one. I was thinking about the silhouettes if there was any example you were trying to show. Yes, I'm going to show that. I haven't gone to that yet. Oh, hold on. Uh, Nishant has uh, would like some more explanation about level planes. How to get straight lines as sometimes yeah. it is difficult to get the vantage point. That's a question okay. from Nishant. All right. Okay, so there's uh, three things um, I'll, I'll just talk about. The first thing is to get the plane right. What plane am I talking about? Uh, you're basically shooting the facade of the building, right? The front portion. So you want, that's the vertical plane. You want it to be perfectly vertical. So all you have to do is tilt your camera um, vertically to get it parallel to the monument and you'll get it straight. It doesn't matter where you're standing, how far you're standing. All you need to do is rotate your camera to get the vertical plane straight. And uh, for the horizontal plane, you, rec you uh, tilt your camera horizontally to get it parallel. That's about the planes. As for the lines, it's difficult to let get the lines straight when it's a wide angle shot because you're going to have some distortion. One thing you can do is 
go back as much as you can till the distortion goes away or uh, you have to pick a lens that doesn't have as much distortion but like you said it's difficult to you know move too much in a crowded place so I suggest let the lines be let the distortion be that's fine but the lines and planes that you can line up line up as much as you can because in post processing when you have a software like Lightroom it is possible to correct for lens distortions but this is something you cannot correct Nishant, does that answer your question? Ajay, can you unmute him? Yes, uh, yes I think uh, that's a valid point that you said like I can rotate the camera to adjust the plane. Yes, so you can line up the plane parallel to the plane of your camera. Yeah, that is helpful. Thank you. No problem. As for the distortion, like you said, you can't move about too much in a crowded yes. place. So just let that be and uh, now there is a charming distorted image, you just have to tell yourself that. Okay. Now I'm going back to flares and silhouettes. Uh, so I'll now show you some an example of flares. So you see those multicolored ring uh, running into the image. Basically this is a cave and the sun was right behind. So if I took a step back, all I was getting was a black blob. There was no detail showing up. So what you do is go closer, cut out most of the sunlight, just let a few rays towards the periphery come in and you'll get this, uh, you know, these uh, strange artifacts. You'll see them right in the camera, so you, it's not like something you discover after you're shooting. After you shoot, you'll see them in the viewfinder or your LCD. So go closer or backward till you get the kind of flare you want. You see the uh, multicolored rings? That's the flare. Sometimes this can appear like a star burst, or you can have concentric, uh, you know, like arcs or circles. That's how you get lens flares. Now this is a silhouette. A silhouette need not be 100% black. It can be partly illuminated as well. So this was around sunset. You can see that the sun is to my right. It's not behind me. It's not behind the Taj Mahal. It's somewhere on the right. It's the setting sun. So you have blue and red hues in the sky. And obviously you can't see any of the details in the monuments, but because these are famous, recognizable monuments, it still works. Make sure you don't have any distractions in front for this image, because all you're going to see is the outline. So if you have something in front, it will just alter the outline of the main monument. So that's pretty much uh, what techniques I wanted to share. You can use them alone or you can use them in combinations. Uh, for example, I told you about the th uh, rule of thirds, right? You can do a um, diagonal composition even while using rule of thirds. Put two subjects on two uh, opposite, two diagonal points and you have a diagonal composition. And then don't shy away from the cliched shots. Even the photos in which you're holding the top of the Taj Mahal or trying to hold up the leaning tower, those may be silly but they're fun and it has to be fun, right? So don't shy away from those. And also remember that you're working in digital. Storage is cheap. So don't come away without being absolutely satisfied with your shots. Because you, you don't visit these places again and again. So shoot, review. If you're not happy, recompose, reshoot as many times as you want. Rules are meant to be, break, meant to be broken. But break them unapologetically for maximum impact. The point is it shouldn't look like a mistake. It needs to look like you did it on purpose. So just go ahead and break the rules boldly. Not half-hearted, but bold. And also remember to take some time to soak in the atmosphere. It will help you see the story you want to shoot. And also you're there to have an experience, right? So don't forget that in your quest for the perfect photograph. So that's pretty much what I wanted to share. Do you have any more questions? Uh, cool, great. Uh, thanks, Madhu. I think I'll also uh, use some of the techniques when I go to a, a monument next time. Uh -huh. uh, but people, um, if you have questions, uh, I'm going to unmute everybody now. And uh, uh, so what Google does is it automatically detects and all that. So uh, check if somebody else is asking a question. Please give them some uh, a few minutes and then uh, talk to talk or uh, what do you call ask your questions later but i'm un unmuting everyone right now so okay. you can ask questions if you really want to 
and uh, um, so yeah, I see some people who have muted from their side. Um, but uh, yeah, you can also ask questions on the chat window, and of course, you can also ask on the Facebook group. I'm monitoring that right now. If you're not able to um, ask a question on the Hangout itself, you can always ask on the Facebook group. And if you can't ask there, you can always, I mean, if you ha don't have questions right now, you can always ask later. Uh, Madhu is also on the, uh, what do you call, Facebook group for the GCAs. Uh, you can al always, uh, she'll be able to answer that. And uh, if she doesn't, I'll get behind her to make her answer. <laughs> So, <laughs> so there's no problem there, and uh, you can always view this video. Uh, it is since it is being recorded on our YouTube channel. You can always come back to it later if you want to. Uh, so there's no issue. So if you have questions, please uh, go ahead now. Yeah, I think there is. Uh, Stephanie is asking something. Hold on. Okay, so Stephanie has a question. What's the best setting for underwater photographs? Uh, Madhu, would you have any idea? Never done it, and you, the first thing is you need a protective uh, uh, case for it, which I don't have. Right. So Stephanie, and I, can't I guess. Swim. Yeah, I can't swim. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So Stephanie, I, I guess uh, uh, Madhu is not the right person to ask that question to because uh, her focus is on uh, uh, monuments and uh, heritage and travel. But um, I'll try to find somebody who has done underwater pho photography and uh, try to get that answer for you. Uh, anybody else? Any questions? Please ask. We'll wait for we. It's 7:47. We can end at 8. And uh, please remember, this does not really end right here. You can always ask questions later at the on the Facebook group or uh, email it or something like that. That is also okay. Uh, but it's good to see you all. I mean, I see a lot of people who have joined. Tejinder, uh, you might have some questions. Tejinder, by the way, is a very good photographer. He uh, he actually shared a beautiful photograph of Qutub Minar, uh, which I which I was like really really impressed with. It's really really beautiful, and I see his Facebook wall constantly. Uh, what do you call active with uh, very beautiful photo photographs of people, land, uh, places. Uh, maybe he has some questions. Okay. Tejinda, you had any? Do you have any comments, or uh, you have anything uh, to talk about some of the topics we uh, spoke about today, or even uh, Nishant, for example? Nishant also is a photographer first and a traveler later. Uh, maybe somebody, some comments, something like that. Yeah, Ajay Nishant is right. Hi, Nishant. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Maybe what I was thinking, uh, we can share some of the photographs with Madhu, and you know, hmm. she can critically review and. Tell us, okay, maybe some points we are missing in the photographs. So some of the subjects she covered, and we have also clicked some photographs in the past. So it, would it be a good idea if we can post something on the Facebook page and you know can get it reviewed, so that Absolutely. it's a better understanding of what actually because it's clicked by us and we we get much more understanding in terms of see how it should be and what is it is today. So. Absolutely, Nishant. Uh, please share your photographs. Uh, um, you are welcome to do that. Uh, Madhu will be around, so yes, uh, she can uh, talk about your photographs too. So Tejinder, we can Michael. actually critique each other. I think I'm no expert really, just stuff I've picked up along the way. So we can just critique each other's pictures to make everyone better. Sure, sure, that will be really helpful. Yeah, Tejinder, that's okay. Uh, you can ask on chat also if you have questions or comments or something. Uh, please go ahead. Microphone is also uh, that's also fine, if it, even if it is not working. Uh, but anybody else uh, who wants to ask questions, please go ahead now. Cool. Okay, so it looks like we don't have questions right now. Tejinder says. Maybe just thanks. to answer yes. what Tejinder asked about, uh, you know, exif that will uh, work pretty much for all conditions. I think uh, F9 is pretty cool. That's what everybody. Uh, you know, it, it'll work for pretty much all conditions for monuments, F9. Cool. So F9 is the answer for Tejinder's earlier question on... Uh, but there's no hard and fast um, answer. But F9 pretty much works most of the time. So that's for sunny weather photography. If you're doing uh, photography of monuments in uh, sunny weather, where uh, which is most probably when you will visit a place, uh, yeah. who wants to go in rainy weather, right? 
But uh, it's yeah, great, actually, know. rainy weather pictures are great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, no that's just from the rain. That's just me, the Tyro speaking. I have no clue about photography. <laughs> and I don't have any, actually, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, patience, unfortunately, <laughs> for a lot of photography stuff. But uh, Stephanie, that's OK, too. I mean, uh, yeah, you should uh, definitely let us know when you have pictures. So uh, by the way, Stephanie is from South Africa. And uh, um, she is a maritime archaeologist at the Unis University of South Africa. And wow. uh, her. Uh, her question was about underwater photography because she says that uh, those photos usually end up uh, uh, awful because of poor lighting. Oh. Uh, but she will try some more techniques and uh, she wants to try the framing technique, especially underwater this time. So awesome. uh, that's her uh, feedback. Um, so, Tejinda, you wanted to ask something else, right? Was that? Okay. Uh, Bekun Thanat Sahu has a question. Um, he wanted to know a little bit of physics behind photography and uh, he says thanks because he got to know that from the first slide you made, uh, Madhu. So awesome. thanks for you. Awesome. <laughs> Good. Uh, so uh, yeah, I remember uh, reading about uh, the camera technique or even the way eyes perceive images and uh, everything in physics in school. Mm -hmm. Of course, I only remember that I read about it, but I don't remember the exact <laughs> physics behind it. So yeah, I only remember that. Uh, yeah, Tejinda, you had any question? Any further questions? I you did mention something there. <clears throat> yes. Apart from framing, is there any ideal post-processing techniques we can follow? That is a question from Tejinda. Okay. Um, if it's a rainy day, you might want to just enhance contrast. Expo uh, increase exposure just a little bit because that's what you lose out on rainy days and uh, white cloud cover kind of days. And if it's a sunny day, you might want to do some uh, highlight recovery and just uh, expose some more details from your uh, darker regions. I'm assuming you, show, you shoot in RAW, right? So if you do that, you can recover details from your shadows and highlights. That's pretty much the basic post-processing. You can do anything over and above that is cool. Cool. All right. Great. So Priyo from Indonesia has a question. How to get a good photo or a panorama photo? So they went, uh, I mean, uh, it was World Heritage Day last uh, Friday, and they went yeah. on a temple trail last week. Okay. Uh, so he had a question on that. I believe okay. he also shared it on the uh, workshop or the event page. He, uh, he shared one picture, if you remember, Madhu. So that okay. was a yes, yes, yes. Photo. I saw that. Yeah, yeah. So three temples and yeah. uh, so that one. So that is a question from Priyo. How to what, any tips on composing a panorama shot? Okay, I'll have to get back to him on this one because I've never played with panoramas. Okay, all right. Yeah. So Priyo, uh, Madhu will get back to you on that uh, on the Facebook group itself. So watch out for the answer okay. there. Yeah. Cool. So any more questions for Madhu? Like I said, you can always ask on the Facebook group later. Um, this is again exclusive for uh, you folks. It is not for. It is not a public group, so you can always ask here on the Facebook group and uh, on the event page also. Uh, we are there. Madhu will be there too. And uh, yeah, so basically share your experiences, share your photos if you want uh, her to uh, have a look and have. If she has any suggestions, she can always share that with you and uh, that's the idea but uh, Tejinder said thanks for the post processing voila, tips you're most welcome so that was that so I guess uh, we are well within our uh, and there is a question for you okay <laughs> Oh, where did I get my glasses from? So that's the question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so well, uh, uh, this is uh, what do you call, I actually was impressed <laughs> by this movie called uh, Gulal. I don't know if you have seen it. It's a political thriller and it just blew my mind away. So the one guy has a Gandhi glasses there. It's like really, really perfect round uh, frames and I wanted to get something like that. but. This is the closest I was able to get. <laughs> but yeah, I keep uh, getting this question. <laughs> Sometimes people ask, OK, okay where is this weird uh, kind of specs from? <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a shop in Banjara Hills in Hyderabad. I can give you the reference if you're really looking to <laughs> get one for yourself. <laughs>
Yeah, well, um, so yeah, um, so if you have questions, uh, please uh, let me know right now, or uh, we'll go ahead and end this session on Google Hangouts. And uh, I think this is working pretty well, right? If you have any feedback on how we can do better, please write up and uh, tell us. Um, I'm also uh, always eager to hear your feedback. And uh, just to let you know, okay, what kind of uh, workshop you're going to do in the future? That's a question from Vaikuntha. I am not sure right now. Let me find a few good speakers. There are a couple of people abroad also. It is a little bit of a problem to coordinate with timings and so on. Uh, let me see. I will keep you informed. Yeah. So we'll try to get some people, hopefully from uh, uh, history or heritage or conservation or archaeology kind of domains, so that you can ask your questions um, or about those also because. Uh, right now, GoUNESCO is basically focusing on awareness, right? So that's our main focus. But uh, of course, it all ends to conservation and preservation. And uh, uh, if you know the science behind it, you will be quite boggled. Uh, there'll be a lot of uh, there is a lot of things going on even in that uh, domain, even with technology being used in several different ways. I would like to get somebody from a foundation, well, of a company called SciArc. These people are actually. Um, <coughs> What do you call scanning world heritage sites in 3D for uh, for the future? So that is a very cool project, according to me. I think it's really wonderful, and uh, they are based outside. Let me yes, it is digital. It's all uh, just look it up. C Y A R K. It is a what do you call short for cyber arc, like Noah's Ark. It is cyber arc. So they are going to preserve everything in digital, and uh, hopefully we'll get somebody from there. But I have mentioned the other plans for uh, our, uh, what do you call, uh, for the GoUNESCO Campus Ambassador Program also. This year, hopefully, we'll expand to a lot more universities and make this a little more structured with a few coordinators full time and also a few faculty members and so on. And uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, I'm still looking for people. I'm trying to put that structure in place. And um, But uh, this was about the um, second Hangout, second online workshop for GCS. And uh, we will end. But uh, there's one thing I wanted to let you know. I've sent the uh, certificates for all the um, ambassadors who have entered their addresses in that sheet I had shared. If you haven't, please enter your details, and I'll send uh, the other batch later. I'll also send the, what do you call, the tracking numbers for you to keep track of when the what do you call post arrives? I've sent it through speed post, so they should be pretty reliable. And there is tracking number also available, so I'll send you that personally to each one of you, and you can have a look. But uh, with this, we will end this workshop by saying thanks to Madhu. And, and thank uh, you all for joining and listening to me. So Madhu's uh, blog is online. You can check it out, and uh, you can always uh, see how beautiful those pictures are. I've done a couple of walks with her once near in the old city of Hyderabad, once we went to Falakma Palace and uh, shot some, I mean, she shot beautiful pictures. I was just doing the, <laughs> uh, I was just getting a hang of the place. Uh, it is quite beautiful, actually. Uh, I particularly I particularly like the picture which she shot of some rose petals falling from above. Um, I, <laughs> I don't think that has the monument in the picture itself, but <laughs> yeah, that's my, uh, um, uh, that's my favorite picture from that uh, walk. Uh, Baikunta says, thank you. It feels like it was a family teaching learning. Uh, thank you, Baikunta, for joining. Thanks, Tejinder. Thanks, Prashant, Priyo, uh, Stephanie, uh, Tejinder, Nishant. Uh, I can see you guys. I don't know who else joined on YouTube. I don't know. I'm not sure if Ashanti joined. She had a question on when to, how to join this, and uh, then probably she could not. But thank you all for joining. Thanks, Madhu, for the uh, wonderful insights. It is very, very uh, good to learn stuff like that. Um, thank you. It gives again. a different perspective. And uh, like she said, just watch for different uh, possibilities. When you visit a monument, it is, not, it is not just the front side view, which you can capture in your photographs. Just remember those key principles. The presentation is also shared online on our SlideShare account. Uh, you can always go back to it and uh, refer to it if you are looking to uh, what do you call, make it a little better, Your the next picture you shoot of a monument. With this, we end. It's exactly 8 o'clock, so we are right on time. Wonderful job, everyone. Thanks for joining on time, and uh, thanks, Madhu, for keeping it going right on pace. Thank you. Thank you so much.
all right then see you guys have a great weekend and uh, good night yeah bye 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 madhu bye chalo see you guys hi everyone hello hello hi um anyone else who can hear me yeah hi ajay nishan this side hey hi great cool so it's just 7 let me check if uh, everybody else is on and uh, who else is on basically some people said they have uh, other stuff to do so they may not join but uh, yeah that should be fine i guess they can always view this online hi who's there Hello. yes yes hello hello okay okay so i was actually <laughs> running another video on the side and uh, that was echoing so i stopped that now i'm trying to see where the settings are for this how can i put everyone on mute what i'm doing is uh, putting everyone on mute and uh, video on off initially so that uh, we don't i mean so google actually just uh, switches between people as soon as it detects somebody talking so we won't we don't want that to be interrupting the whole session so i'm going to do that i'm going to switch all audio off for everyone and later i'll also go on mute once we finish with the introduction and then uh, as soon as madhu starts we'll um i'll be, i'll also be on mute but i'll be around um people you can also join the chat there is a chat on the left side so you can uh, ask your questions here or you can also go ahead and uh, you can also go ahead and uh, put your messages up on the facebook page we will i will be tracking that so you could do that as well cool so um to introduce madhu so this is again hello and welcome to the second online workshop for the goinesco campus ambassadors um we are trying to give you uh, some kind of benefit for helping us out at goinesco uh, you might have heard uh, we just finished our finale last saturday uh, it was uh, it was pretty awesome we had uh, quite a few people turn up and uh, one of the guests was from unesco new delhi the other guest was from intac hyderabad indian national trust for arts culture and heritage um there were two other guests also one was the director of salajing museum in hyderabad and uh, the other final guest was from the andhra pradesh state um department for museums and archaeology uh, so they were there the winners uh, took away some really cool prizes and uh, nishant is actually one of the winners uh, last year so he's also on the uh workshop right now he's also on the session um but basically we are trying to like i mentioned on the facebook group also we are trying to make this big this year the campus ambassador program i am looking for a lot more uh, um 
spread in terms of the number of universities and I'm also looking at the number of activities being uh, much more than what we have done previously but it's great that we have got to hear uh, you people have actually helped me get that confidence and uh, for that I thank you um, I'm looking forward to your help in the future also uh, we will be uh, I will be updating you on all the other plans which as and when we uh, get there uh, but um, for now, let's begin with this workshop today. To introduce you to Madhu, she is a photographer. She has um, been photographing, I mean, you can also check her work online. She has a passion for her old city in Hyderabad. She keeps photographing whenever possible. She has done a lot of, she has put up a lot of beautiful pictures on her uh, blog called, uh, uh, okay, which one is that, Madhu? Is that Adab? Adab, Adab. Yeah. Yeah, so that's adabheatherward.blogspot.com and uh, she does a lot of travel photography as well. And uh, so that's a brief introduction. She's also on the Goinesco Challenge, by the way. So uh, second person to give the, I mean, take a workshop, conduct a workshop rather, and uh, second person also on Goinesco Challenge. Hopefully we'll have a lot more uh, different uh, 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 people on these sessions in the future maybe some people from abroad also. I don't know if Ashanti has joined today, Ashanti, Stephanie, uh, but uh, they they did RSVP, yes. If they're not able to join the live chat, they can always uh, view this online. Um, so there's some good stuff happening in these sessions, and I like that uh, we are seeing some part participation. This time, more people have joined on the Hangouts, which is uh, encouraging. Last time, I believe everybody was on the YouTube video directly. Uh, so you can ask questions on the group chat window on the right corner of your Hangout window. Uh, so I'll turn over now to Madhu. Madhu, you can take it over. So basically, I'll just uh, prepare you for what is happening. So you can uh, see a link to a presentation. It's a slide share presentation. I have uploaded it on the event workshop. Uh, OK, I haven't done that yet, but I'll do that now. Uh, basically, you can view that presentation, and uh, um, Madhu will be going over that presentation um, as we begin. Uh, you can also see the presentation online right here. I've just shared it on the event page on Facebook. If you want, you can open that for reference as well. Uh, we'll be going over principles of taking pictures, better pictures at monuments. This is not going into a lot of detail. This will be a little high level, but it will help you in designing or rather thinking about the basic concepts which should, you should keep in mind when you're taking photographs of monuments especially. This is not portrait photography. This is not interior photography. This is photography of monuments, which is very relevant to what we do at GoInesco. There's plenty of people taking pictures of World Heritage Sites and uh, monuments also. So now I'll turn it over to Madhu now, and uh, she will take it on from here. Yes, Madhu, you can begin. I will go on mute. Uh, if I'm required, just let me know. Okay. And, Do you uh, hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Too loud? No, no. This is pretty, pretty okay. good. Yeah. Uh, so, hi, hi everyone. Uh, one thing all of us here have in common is obviously our love for travel. That's why we're all on Go UNESCO. Now, it's true that a lot of us travel just for the experience, but we do put in a lot of time, effort, and enthusiasm into all of this. So it's always great to come back with a nice set of photos and relive the experience every time we go through them. So like Ajay said, today I'm going to share some tips with you that will hopefully help, hopefully help you come back with a better set of pictures the next time you go to a World Heritage Site or any other monument for that matter. I'll try and keep things as general as possible so that it doesn't matter what kind of camera you're using. This will pretty much apply to everyone. Uh, so I'll now share my screen with you and uh, show you some of the slides that I made. What you have uh, shared on the Facebook page has just the uh, slides with the text. I'll be sharing quite a bit of photos here to illustrate the points I'm making there. So uh, I'm sharing my screen now. Uh, does everyone see this? Okay, cool. So uh, I thought I'll just begin with how a photo is formed in your camera. Now it doesn't matter what camera it is again. 
uh, you, all you have is your subject and you have your camera. Look at the image on the top left, that little uh, diagram there. So uh, the boy standing there is your subject. So light reflected off your subject enters the camera through your lens. It passes through an opening behind it called the aperture. Behind the aperture you have the shutter. The shutter remains closed by default. Only when you press the shutter release button, which is that main button you press to click a photo, that's the only time it opens. It stays open for the duration of the photo and then it closes again. So it opens, allows light inside and then your camera forms an image of uh, your subject on the film or since we are talking about digital cameras, it forms an image on the sensor which then records it. Now uh, there are two things that we need to control. The main components you see are the aperture and shutter that contribute uh, to the image formation. The first thing is you need to decide the length of time for which the shutter remains open. This you can control by changing the shutter speed. The second factor is the amount of light coming in while the shutter is open. This you can vary by changing the size of the aperture. If too much light comes in, your photo will appear white and washed out. If too little comes in, it will be all dark. So basically your camera needs to measure the brightness of different parts of the image and then use some algorithms to calculate what the overall exposure must be because uh, your image will have some bright regions, some dark regions, so it needs to take all these things into account and decide how much to expose. These are this, this process is called metering, the process of calculating how much light to allow inside. In loose terms, that's what it is. You decide how much light to allow inside. Now, one common example that people use while explaining the concept of shutter speed and aperture is a tap water example. Basically, you have a tap and you have a bucket which you need to fill with water. If you open your tap really thin, it'll take a long time to fill the bucket, obviously. And then if you open it really thick, the bucket will, will fill up very fast. Exposures like that. If the aperture is narrow, you need to keep the shutter open for a long time to expose the image properly. If the aperture is wide, you only need to open the shutter for a short while. One last important variable that I want to mention is the focal length. Technically, it is the distance between the lens and the sensor when the subject is in focus. You can see this in the diagram. Uh, it's normally measured in millimeters. Uh, essentially, it tells you how close you are to the image. Uh, we talk about zoom lenses, right? You zoom in and out. That's how you get closer to the image or farther away. Now, um, there are different kinds of cameras you could be using. Basically, for every shot, you need to decide the shutter speed, aperture, exposure, and all of that. Uh, if you're using your camera in an automatic mode, which is the way it is in most compact point and shoot cameras, your mobile phone cameras, you really don't need to decide all these things. The camera decides for you. Whereas on SLR cameras, you have complete control over all these things. You can operate it in a manual mode and you can personally decide what, what the shutter speed must be, what the aperture size must be and all of that. Now you can take compelling photos whether you're using a traditional tiny point and shoot or an SLR or your uh, phone's camera. So it really doesn't matter and I'm going to keep this generic. So uh, you look at the list on the right side. That's basically the steps that go into forming a photo. The first thing you do is you go to the place, uh, whatever monument you're visiting, look around, decide what story you want to tell through your photos. You look through the viewfinder or your LCD and you compose the image and then you have to control the light. Uh, we're going to assume that you're using everything in an automatic mode, so I'm not really going to talk about light. So the composition is ready, the light is done, now you just shoot. Now it's digital, so you have all the freedom in the world to review, reshoot, review, reshoot till you're happy with the pictures. And then you go home, transfer your photos to your computer. If you like, you can process them to enhance some stuff. But that's about it, that's what goes into the making of a photo. Uh, so with these basics out of the way, we'll now go straight to monument photography, all right? The first requirement for a good photo is good light, obviously. So uh, let's now talk about when we have the best light to take pictures of a monument. The thumb rule is this, when light falls on the monument at an angle, that's the best time. 
so this happens in early mornings mid morning late afternoon around sunset the extra advantage you have with early mornings is that there's no crowd so you don't have people messing up your photo and you have soft light the sun is still not harsh and then you can also finish up quickly before it gets too hot the bright colors in the sky around sunset are also pretty awesome you have these uh, it's like the typical instagram kind of sky with multiple hues in the sky those work great if you're attempting silhouettes i'll talk about that a little later sunny days with deep blue skies and fluffy white clouds are my favorite kind of day those make the most colorful backdrops you have direct sunlight so you get strong contrasts you get crisp shadows but the downside of having strong contrast is that you lose a little bit of the details what i mean by that is some of the details disappear into the shadows this kind of light is usually called hard light now what happens when you have a cloud cover some days are not blue you just have this uh, dull white cloud cover that's not always a bad thing because clouds act as diffusers you have water droplets in the clouds they kind of scatter the light in all directions so it's not like a harsh direct light you get a soft light your monument whatever you're photographing is illuminated evenly all over you don't have harsh shadows even in the shadow regions you have a reasonable amount of details so obviously contrast is low as a result if you have too much of a cloud cover that is if the clouds are too thick you will have a very flat and dull photo so you, you basically need a little bit of shadows to give your image depth so you need to strike that balance between contrast and shadows one thing to avoid um, okay yeah rainy days rainy days can be quite dramatic but keeping your gear safe is a challenge you do get protective cases and stuff you can get for your camera that's the kind of um, equipment people use for uh, you know tip, uh, rain photos or really close to waterfalls or even underwater photography but that's for that's only if you're really serious about investing in that sort of equipment the best option if you want is to shoot right after it rains when when it rains all the particles in the air are kind of washed down everything is clean so colors in your uh, monument really pop and also your equipment stays safe this is ideal the main thing you need to avoid is shooting when the front of the monument is in a shadow region so uh, what happens is before going to the place if you can find out in which direction the monument faces then you can really time your visit so that it's not in a shadow uh, for an for, uh, for an example uh, in the old city of hyderabad i keep going to photograph mosques we know that all mosques face mecca so in india uh, they are illuminated by the sun in the early morning so as a thumb rule i only go in the mornings if i want to shoot mosque so it really helps to find out beforehand the orientation of the building now sometimes uh, you you really there just for one day time is difficult to make for travel you have one day off you take a day off from work and you go so you really don't have the flexibility to pick and choose the time so uh, a few slides down the line i'll show you how you can make the best of um, a time like that when you know the uh, sun is behind the monument so uh, i'll now show you some examples this is a typical day with a white cloud cover now you can see that the illumination is pretty even throughout you can see a good amount of details but it's not so contrasty and you can see that it lacks some kind of punch right so i uh, look at the same place on a day when there was a blue sky and there were white fluffy clouds see the difference it makes to the colors now it's not the exact same photo but it's the same place you can see that shadows are deeper you do lose some details in the shadows but overall it's much more vibrant so this is what you get when you go on a sunny day with a blue sky and a little bit of cloud here and there a plain blue sky can also get boring and now this is what happens on a rainy day now this was on a really rainy day it rained almost all day and i shot this picture when the rain stopped briefly in between so you can see that colors are bright and also you have dark clouds above because there was more rain to come those actually make the picture more dramatic if it's just white clouds all it does is make the whole thing dull but dark rain clouds add drama which is always welcome 
And now this is the disaster that happens when the front of your building is in shadow. There's nothing you can salvage out of this. So now we move on from light to composition. Is there anything you want to ask? Do you want to ask now or later, Ajay? Uh, people, you can ask anytime you want. You can uh, start uh, questions on the group chat or you could also put it up on the uh, Facebook group page. I'll be monitoring that. So you could do it either way. I mean, uh, if you have questions which really require you to ask the question right away, uh, please go ahead and ask on the chat window. I'm uh, putting everybody on mute so that at least uh, Madhu doesn't get disrupted or interrupted. But you can always ask using the chat, all right? Okay. Yeah, so Madhu, yeah, go on. Okay, so I'm now moving on to composition from light. The deal is that you can pick the kind of day you want to shoot on, but I'm not going into manual control of your shutter and aperture settings. So um, if you're using a camera on automatic mode, all you can do is pick the right time to shoot and move on. So now uh, you will see my... Um, do I have to share my screen again or do you see it? Yeah, all right. So uh, we now uh, begin with composition. Wide shots which show the whole monument are pretty common. That's the kind of thing most people tend to take. But don't dismiss it just because it's common. With the right light and symmetry, you can make them look great. But don't stop with just that. You can do a lot more to get a nice set of compelling photos. So zoom in, capture carvings, sculptures, and all the little details that you can notice. Get low. Try low angles. You can you'll see that a statue, if you if you if you take a picture of a statue standing right in front of it, and then try another picture of the st same statue from a lower angle, you'll see that some features are exaggerated. So you get really quirky, interesting pictures. And also walk all around the monument. You never know what you're going to find at the back or on the sides. You might find something really interesting. Look for repeating patterns. Uh, a frame with a single repeating pattern is an awesome image. Repetitions are always awesome. And then look for images, look for views of the monument from other places. Walk around the neighborhood, go to other nearby buildings, see if you get a nice view from there. Generally walk around and see if you spot something interesting. But this will work only if the monument is reasonably big because unless it's really tall, you won't see it from uh, other places. The Taj Mahal, for example, is visible from a lot of places. Uh, I spotted it driving around in Agra and then again when you go to the Red Fort, you again have a view of it. So don't limit a monument just to that monument. There may be other places which give you interesting views of it. So let's look at some examples now. This is the traditional wide shot. This is cliched but you can make it attractive and if you come back and show it to somebody who hasn't been there, they know exactly what it looks like. Or you can zoom in and capture the little details. The thing about this image is that this carving is just about a foot tall. but it, And you can actually miss it when you're walking around. But if you fill up your frame with it, it looks totally different. And then I'm going to the next example. Walk around. You'll, you'll, you'll definitely find interesting stuff to shoot if you walk around. This shows a little bit of local culture. And if you come back and show the picture to someone, they'll probably wonder what the significance of the lemons and the rituals is. It's definitely a conversation um, theme. This picture, this is an Eidga. It's uh, seen from the lane behind it. You can see only a part of it, just a couple of the minarets. So that adds a little bit of the mystery. And you wonder who lives on this street, who lives in these houses. And you just get a sneak peek of the monument. It's a very interesting perspective. Another cool thing you can do is look for interesting ways to frame the monument. Most of these places have arches or gateways and stuff. Try and frame the main building through those. Or maybe you're driving by, frame it through the window of your car, through the leaves of a tree. Or like I was saying, from another monument. And one great thing to look for is reflections. It could be in ponds or if it has rain, you can look for puddles. You can like look at rear view mirrors of parked cars or windshields pretty much anywhere. It could be reflections, it could be shadows. Just try and think out of the box. Uh, and I'll show you some examples of framing. 
So um, this is that, uh, it's like a scalloped kind of arch and you look at one part, it doesn't have to be the whole monument you're framing, it could be one interesting portion or one bunch of carvings you're trying to show off. Look for interesting ways to frame them. And this is the Taj Mahal through the gateway. Um, now these people standing here, you notice that the uh, portion behind them is bright whereas the foreground is dark and the people, you can only see the outline of the people, this is called a silhouette and I'll be talking more about this in a bit. Anybody pinged? Yes, Madhu, um, yeah. Tejinder had a question. Okay. Um, he asks, when we are traveling, we generally don't know what kind of weather we will encounter. Right. Since most of the times it's sunny, mm -hmm. do we have some standard EXIF details we can use or okay. you can work around with? Uh, the deal with EXIF details is you have that kind of control of um, you know aperture and shutter only when you're using an SLR or high-end point and shoot. Uh, what I'm going to uh, talk about in a while is, uh, see I just told you the ideal kind of conditions where you can take pictures. But obviously we don't know what kind of weather we're going to encounter. So what we can do is find workarounds. For example, if you're stuck with the monument lit up from behind and the front is entirely in shadow, you won't get the best pictures, but there are things you can do to come back with decent pictures. I'll be talking about lens flares and silhouettes a little while later. Uh, those are workarounds for backlit monuments. Or when you have a, a rainy day, you, you are going to get good pictures. It's not the ideal kind of uh, setting, like, you know, uh, there's nothing as good as angular illumination of a building, but even overhead shadows work, a rainy day works, you can pretty much make anything work for you. All you have to do is find workarounds and look at you know, creative ways of, um, you may not get the traditional wide shot, but there are other things you can do. Does that answer that? Uh, cool, I'll watch out for what Tejinder says. Okay. Uh, you can carry on till then. Okay. Yeah. Now this is a bottom up kind of uh, framing. It, you can see it's framed by an arch. This is Humayun's tomb. And uh, there's a, another concept in this photo that I'll be talking about a little later. You can see that the staircase and the railings on both sides kind of lead your eyes to the two women and then to the monument. These are called leading lines and you can really use them to your advantage while composing photos. We'll talk about leading lines in a bit. And then you can look for reflections. This is a regular pond, but reflections can happen even in muddy puddles after a rain. Uh, the thing to remember here is it was a blue sky kind of day, so the water is blue. If it had been a white uh, sky day, you wouldn't have had so many colors in the frame, but it would still be interesting. So now, um, in some temples, they don't let you take pictures inside. Uh, but if they allow you to take pictures inside the monument, don't forget to do that. Photos of the interiors add so much to your uh, story. Try and take photos of the outside from the inside. And churches and places like that have beautiful stained glass. Um, many places, Mughal monuments have perforated screens. So these cast beautiful patterns of light and shadow. Keep your eyes open for those. And uh, you get dramatic shafts of light as well, especially in churches. Look out for those. Look up and see if the ceiling is, uh, if the ceiling deserves a shot, or if you're going to climb up staircases and balconies. Remember to look down. Let's look at some examples. This is an example of taking a photo of the outside when you are inside. So you get a little bit of the monument, and you also get the view that is outside, framed by the monument itself. And this is, these are how you uh, photograph shafts of light. This is a church. This is the Afghan church in Bombay. If you're using an SLR, you need to underexpose a little bit so that you get really sharp shafts of light. You, uh, you can even do this with your mobile phone camera. Uh, we've done it. I wish I'd uh, shared the photo, but it's actually possible even in your mobile phone. Uh, this is how you can look out for perforated screens and the little dots of light they throw on the floor. Again, you might have to underexpose a little bit, otherwise your camera will expose for the bright regions and everything will become too white. Look up, you might find a really interesting ceiling, or look down. 
Sometimes you can climb up to the first level or second level of the monument. Make sure you look down and see if there's any, anything interesting there. Now, distractions aren't really distractions if you can use them to your advantage. Uh, monuments especially, if you haven't been to them, you've only seen pictures, you don't know how big they are, right? So use people, vehicles and familiar objects to convey the size of the monument. Now, I don't know how big, a ta how big the Taj Mahal is if I haven't been there. But I know how tall the average person is. So put a person next to the Taj Mahal and you can establish scale that way. People also add color and movement to the photo. A running child or a, uh, you know, a guy on a bicycle. These are things that the building is stationary at the back. Whereas this person or this cycle has a slight blur to it. So you can show movement in the photo. Or you can just make the monument the uh, secondary thing. Put something else in front some other subject like Chilean or hawkers or whatever and make the monument the backdrop. Who says the monument always has to be the main story? It doesn't have to be. Or if you have local people in the frame, it adds character or you know you could call it the exotic value if you have locals in the frame. Pigeons or any other bird, awesome. They add a lot of atmosphere. Try and avoid distractions like wire and garbage. Those are distractions that are really distractions. So uh, some examples, now this is Mahabalipuram and this uh, woman in the blue sari was sweeping the floor over there. So you can see that she adds a nice pop of blue to what is otherwise just a uh, brown frame overall and you also see how big that wall is because you know how tall she must be. And you can also, uh, the thing to remember in this is um, uh, the closer the uh, person is to you, the smaller the monument is going to look. So by moving the, uh, you know, the, the person or the vehicle, whatever you're using, back and forth, you can actually even exaggerate or uh, underplay the size of the monument. Uh, you must have seen pictures in which you know people are holding the top of the Taj Mahal or holding the sun in their hand. That's how it works. You move the person back and forth, and you actually play with the.